Hello and welcome once again to another review, retro review for Cheap Shot Entertainment, the dedicated wrestling channel for the network. And we're looking at Unforgiven 2002 today because it is exactly 20 years to today, to the day, or the date, that uh, this pay-per-view happened in 2002. It is September 22nd, 2002. It took place at the in Los Angeles at the Staples Center in front of 16,000 in attendance. Um, the theme song was Adrenaline by Gavin Rossdale and the main event, of course, was the Undisputed Championship match between Brock Lesnar and The Undertaker player um as usual we will tell you which games this pay-per-view arena featured in it is wwe smackdown here comes the pain and wwe raw 2 so they haven't put it in any other game um but you can of course watch it on the network which is where i'm watching it now so it's subject to creative edits it is a dual branded pay-per-view of course the brand split happened um earlier on in the year and uh, yeah it was uh, or it is rather uh, you know good place to you know go and watch some old school wrestling in 2002 it's a really good year um to um to go back to Really, really good, and I've really enjoyed doing doing this year, and rolling on to two thousand three. Wow! <laughs> By the end of two thousand three, it's looking good. Um, so yeah, if you want to join us for the main part of the video, we'll be going through all the matches, including the pre-show, very, very briefly. And uh, yeah, go back and watch it. Let us know what you think and uh, what your thoughts are. Do you have any memories of going to watch? Unforgiven 2002. Let us know in the comments section or on social media. That's Instagram, Facebook and Twitter. And we'll see you in the main part of the video. This is awesome! This is awesome! The pre-show as ever would take place on Sunday Night Heat. And this would happen before the main event would start for Unforgiven. Uh, we have Rey Mysterio versus Chavo Guerrero, where Rey Mysterio picks up the win. It's very much a case of, hey, look at our stacked card, and we put Rey Mysterio and Chavo Guerrero on the pre-show. And uh, then we go straight into the... Uh, the, the the event and uh, we start off with a an eight man tag again look at this look at how much talent we've got we don't know what to do with them very reminiscent of a certain uh, other company that is around now <laughs> um, but yeah it's uh, it's going to be a good one I'm going to go and uh, watch the match and come back to you first match up is the eight man tag match between the un Americans and a group of Americans. It is Kane, Booker T, Goldust and Bubba Ray, the most ragtag bunch of all-American badasses that you could find, uh, versus the un-Americans. That is Christian, Landstorm, William Regal and Tess. Three Americans and an Englishman. Um, <laughs> despite usually being a bit of a cluster, eight-man tag, eight-person tag matches, there, this one was actually quite enjoyable. There were a few parts that were quite telegraphed, and that's me looking at it through my critical eye of being, you know, a trainee uh, in a wrestling school. Uh, but it didn't make it any less enjoyable. The crowd was really warm for this one, really hot. Um, all they wanted to see was tables. Uh, they didn't. They did get to see a table, which unceremoniously got. Baseball slid into Booker T's face as the referee was trying to gain control because obviously with an eight-person tag, there isn't much control with the referee and it's kind of 
keeping up with who is legal and who is not. So we do get some wrestling moves to start with, some normal sort of wrestling holds and Magnificent Sevens and all that kind of stuff uh, to start with, a few tags, and then it breaks down really quickly. You know, it goes a good 10 minutes. It was really good match actually like i say it warmed the crowd up it did everything that it needed to do i was really really into this one i didn't think i would be based on the fact that the un-americans are uh, a product of possibly a product of 2000 2001 get get the american people behind the americans that kind of thing um but Individually and together, they are four very, very good individual wrestlers. And together, they have a lot of experience. You've got uh, William Regal and Lance Storm with all the experience. They've had some battles down the years. And, of course, then you, you have uh, Test, who's the big man, and Christian, who is a bit of a flyer. Um, and then, obviously, on the other team, Booker T, Goldust, they were thrown together um, as a tag team, worked really well, one of the very few examples of this. And then, of course, you've got Bubba Ray Dudley, who was split from his brother Devon in the draft, and uh, which I'll never understand. And, uh, of course, then you've got... Um, uh, I've forgotten the fourth person on that one. <laughs> oh, Kane! <laughs> Kane, oh, well, I could have, I could have forget Kane, uh, because it was Kane after a shotgun finish that picked up the victory, uh, just as William Regal was reaching into his tights to, um, you know, pull the power of the punch out. Um, you know, it's very important that it goes and rubs his crotch before he does that because it makes it more powerful. Uh, Kane spotted this, took him out. It was Lance Storm who was the. Legal man, uh, well-spotted referee Nick Patrick, because I'd lost uh, who was legal in this match. And Kane would, uh, yeah, hit him with a punch and, um, yeah, hit the power of the punch. Uh, lots of choke slams and things in between as well. Uh, and pick up the victory over Lance Storm. Uh, really good match, really good match. Uh, good opener, three out of three cheap shots out of five for this one. Um, showcased how much talent the WWE had at this point in time. Uh, perhaps, you know, if they didn't do this, there would be uh, people who would be off the card and missing a payday, much like AEW are doing now. Um, but that being said, you know, they still had plenty of tag teams. It, it's more um, gaining your footing. Where, where are you going to be by the end of 2002? That kind of thing, you know? So, uh, yeah, it's um, it's a good one to kick us off, and uh, yeah, we move on. By the way, um, before the show started, I will mention this because they don't do this much anymore. The video package was really good, um, showcasing both titles because, of course, the world championship was on the line as well in this pay per view. Um, the Promo package at the beginning really got me going for this uh, pay-per-view. And like I say, the first match didn't disappoint. Next up is the Intercontinental Championship match between the champion Chris Jericho and Ric Flair. This is a feud that's continued on from SummerSlam. And uh, it would see Chris Jericho defending the championship against Ric Flair. After a first the first couple of minutes getting a feel for each other, get trying to get the upper hand, both guys have submission moves as their finish. Uh, lots of uh, trying to go for the legs, trying to take their opponent down. Ric Flair does get some uh, meat on some of his blows here uh, in the opening minutes here. Uh, in this match, Chris Jericho goes up top, very reminiscent of Ric Flair, tries to get that momentum going, comes down, gets a punch to the gut for his troubles. Um, it would be a flip that would uh, trouble Chris Jericho towards the end of the match as he went for the 
Lion Salt, Ric Flair moved out of the way. He would hear something pop and go down like a sack of spuds and uh, get consoled by the referee, Ric Flair, in two minds of whether to just carry on and keep doing it. Chris Jericho is still pleading, uh, saying, you know, I heard something pop. Um, this, you know, I need, I need, I need help. And the referee, Charles Robinson, Mini Nate, uh, does eventually call for the trainer. Uh, and so at that point, the referee's back is turned and Ric Flair fell for the oldest trick in the book, as they would say. Chris Jericho jumps straight back up. Gets a blow in on Ric Flair. Hooks the uh, legs, brings him onto his back and hooks in the walls of Jericho. As Charles Robinson looks on in disgust, despair, whatever. Ric Flair taps out. Chris Jericho is still your Intercontinental Champion. Now this match wasn't given a lot of time. We're only sort of 10 minutes along from the first match. So probably around about 7 minutes-ish for this one. I think this one could have gone longer and probably should have gone longer. But with these two veterans, you know what you're getting. I'm going to give this one 2.5 cheap shots out of 5. Didn't enjoy it as much as the opener. Because it was so short and these two could have gone uh, much longer and given us a bit of a technical masterpiece. Could have been the match of the night. Obviously with two main championships on the card as well. It probably was never likely that they were going to get any longer than sort of seven, eight minutes. But uh, like I say, two and a half cheap shots out of five. Very in the middle of the road. Um, and Chris Jericho is your winner. But before we had this match, I need to fill you in on what was happening backstage. Stephanie McMahon is talking to Billy and Chuck, uh, saying that you must beat Rosie and Jamal tonight because there are stipulations involved. If Rosie and Jamal beat Billy and Chuck, then Stephanie McMahon has to kiss a lesbian. Um, yeah, there's still some elements of, uh, of this in 2002. And if Billy and Chuck win, Eric Bischoff has to kiss Stephanie McMahon's ass. Um, I'm sure he's just beside himself with the thought of doing that. So to open up this segment, we get a backstage segment with uh, Eric Bischoff and Rosie and Jamal, known as Three Minute Warning. And... Uh, we get an appearance from Rico saying, don't worry, Mr. Bischoff, because Rosie and Jamal are very much prepared for everything that Billy and Chuck can throw at them because Rico knows them inside and out. Uh, they both scoff at that, of course, because it's 2002, not 2022. Uh says, yeah, sit back, grab some popcorn, a smidge of Vaseline. <laughs> I want Stephanie McMahon partake in some hot lesbian action. Yeah, it's 2002, everybody. Anyway, let's move on to the next match because this one is actually really, really good. Um, possibly the best. I mean, it is the best match on the card so far. Um, it is Eddie Guerrero versus Edge. Edge wearing the white trunks with uh, uh, multicolours on them, which is really cool. I really like... Uh, Edge's attire. I always have liked Edge's attire. Uh, Eddie Guerrero wearing more traditional red, black and gold. Again, really, really cool. Uh, big showcase of the mid-carders here. Um, and <clears throat> incredible match. Uh, it went slow to start with. Again, feeling out process. Standard in a wrestling match. And then uh, started picking up the pace towards the middle with both guys getting their shots in. Um, Eddie Guerrero would try and cheat several times and it would be fudged by Edge and um, <clears throat> yeah the, uh, the the victory would come for Eddie Guerrero uh, after Edge went for a spear missed uh, into the execution and uh, gets a near fall but the near fall came was broken up by the placement of Eddie Guerrero being near the ropes, the foot on the ropes breaks the pin. 
uh, very good wrestling knowledge there. Good mat scent from Eddie Guerrero. Um, it would come down to Eddie Guerrero again, trying to cheat, pulling the... He loosened the turnbuckle pad earlier on in the match. Um, uh, Eddie would get the upper hand on Edge, uh, try and ram Edge into the exposed turnbuckle, uh, but Edge would dodge it, and uh, Eddie would run into the exposed turnbuckle, and uh, Edge would follow up with a spear into the corner. And uh, this would lead to Edge putting Eddie Guerrero onto the top rope, ready for uh, a superplex, again, a move that Edge uses a fair bit at this point in his career. Eddie Guerrero would block this. Of course, the referee didn't see the exposed turnbuckle and smash Edge's head off the exposed turnbuckle. A sunset bomb, a wicked looking sunset bomb, massive amounts of impact on this one, uh, would give Eddie Guerrero the win. And uh, a handful of tights there as well. But yeah, if you want to study how to get the upper hand on your opponent, if you're a wrestling student uh, and do it where it makes sense, then this is definitely one of the good matches to watch. Um, really enjoyed this one. I'm going to give it three cheap shots out of five, uh, matching the first match uh, for enjoyment for me. Really and enjoy both of these guys work anyway always have but when you put them both in the ring together bearing in mind that eddie hadn't been in the wwe very long at this point um well i suppose he's coming up to about two years uh, and edge has been more of a um on the tag team team uh, both of these guys are uh, jockeying for position in that mid card going for the intercontinental championship uh, Eddie Guerrero is your winner in this one. Next up is the tag team match between Rosie and Jamal, collectively known as Three Minute Warning, and Billy and Chuck, collectively known as Billy and Chuck. Um, there is a stipulation in this match, and that is if Billy and Chuck win, Eric Bischoff has to kiss Stephanie McMahon's ass sure he's really against that and if Eric Bischoff wins if if Rosie and Jamal win three minute warning then uh, Stephanie McMahon has to perform HLA in the middle of the ring with a lady of Eric Bischoff's choosing so HLA if you didn't know is I'm going to just say it is hot lesbian action. It's 2002. <laughs> I'll keep saying that. Um, not, uh, not definitely not something that you can get away with now. But hey, you know, we've got a match to uh, review. But before that match, we get Triple H walking down the corridor, very confident with his world championship over his shoulder. Walks into the Raw locker room to confront Rob, Rob Van Dam, who he would be going against later on in the night. And, uh, yeah, says that, uh, you know, you would be working out or getting ready with losers like Ric Flair. Yes, losers that are 16-time world champions. Um, and Rob Van Dam says, I'd rather get ready with so-called losers like Ric Flair than so-called winners like you, um, Triple H walks out. Notably, he's clean-shaven at this point, he's Triple H, and Rob Van Dam still high as a kite. So anyway, let's get into the match. So the match starts with a jump start. Uh, Billy and Chuck know that they've got to bring the fight straight away and uh, jump straight in the ring, start the fight, get the upper hand um, to the point where uh, Billy and Kamal are outside the ring and Chuck tries to roll up Rosie. Um, at this point, it's a uh, waist waist grip, uh, waist lock into the ropes, trying for the rollover pin. And uh, Rico gets up on the apron and delivers 
a nice roundhouse kick that hits the mark and that is the turning point of the match with three three minute warning getting most of the offense in here uh, in a heat um, so to speak um, over Chuck and it would be Billy who would be trying to get into the ring all the time with Rosie and Jamal distracting the referee and uh, you know Billy trying to get in and the referee stopping him from getting in obviously because that's how it works you don't hold the tag rope you you can't make the tag and you can't make the save um, you know that is the bread and butter of uh, tag team wrestling if you can work that then you're going to be a darn good tag team wrestler anyway um, it would be uh, just that where uh, they would have the heat there wouldn't be a tag there would be an attempt to save uh, at this point the match completely breaks down um, there's fighting all over the place there's a hot shot um, everyone delivers the finisher um, moment but it doesn't lead to the finish straight away and that would come a little bit later on in the match it's not a very long match that being said around about eight minutes and uh, yeah it would be after everyone delivering the um, finishes again or you know a move it would be Rosie that would throw uh, Chuck into Jamal for the big Samoan drop uh, pop-up Samoan drop which would uh, originally countered by Billy Gunn when they tried it on him um, and near fall there and uh, it would be Chuck that would uh, eat the pin here and Jamal who would get the pin how the referee managed to keep an eye on who was legal and who was not I've no idea there wasn't any kind of law and order in this match. I don't even think, and I think I might have seen a couple of tags from Rosie and Jamal, but that's pretty much it. Um, so there you go. That is the match. Um, like I say, it didn't get given a long time, but it could have been a lot better with these two teams um, being part of it. That being said, I'm going to give this one two cheap shots out of five. It wasn't it wasn't awful, um, but it was definitely the match leading to one of the main events where you want to almost bring the crowd down before you bring them back up again for that championship match. So it's a spot to fill, and uh, you know it is what it is, uh, and that is wrestling. Uh, we go into the back again with Eric Bischoff gloating that, uh, you know, Stephen McMahon's going to have to uh, perform HLA with one of the ladies that he has in the back. He's been interviewed by Coach and uh, they all want a piece of Stephen McMahon, uh, including a HLA chant. I'm just going to leave that there. Let's move on. The next match is the World Heavyweight Championship match. So we move on to the first main event of the evening and it is the World Heavyweight Championship between Triple H, the person who was handed the championship by Eric Bischoff and Rob Van Dam who won a fatal four-way elimination match to become the number one contender. Um, obviously these two had a little bit of a meeting in the locker room earlier on which I mentioned, including Ric Flair, and that would play into this match quite heavily. But early on in the match, Rob Van Dam's getting the better of Triple H, including showing out to the crowd and the audience, who are absolutely 110% behind Rob Van Dam, by drinking and spitting water up into the air and basically just trying to get into the head of the cerebral assassin. Of course, that's not very easy to do. Um, but the tide would turn as Triple H would be on the outside. Rob Van Dam would get very, very little bit cocky. Again, show out, try the 
um, somersault plancher over the top rope to Triple H. Triple H just sidesteps him and he lands straight on his back. Um, <laughs> yeah, it didn't look good. Uh, and from there, Triple H was just on it. First of all, there was the very close 10 count by Earl Hebner. Um, I think giving Bob Van Dam a little bit of leeway, just having his upper body under the rope, stopping the count. Obviously, Triple H walks towards the um, towards his opponent and uh, Earl Hebner has no choice but to try and back him away. So, breaks the count. This is where Triple H puts on all the heat, brings down the heavy hits on Rob Van Dam and it wouldn't be until about five minutes out thereafter where Rob Van Dam would come back with a spinning heel kick to Triple H as he tried to run in on Rob Van Dam. Rob Van Dam then was on top for a good couple of minutes afterwards uh, Picking up the pace, monkey flips, lots of splashes, lots of uh, somersaults, lots of uh, even the uh, rolling thunder pin. Um, hitting uh, all of these, getting near falls after near fall after near fall. Triple H is basically on the ropes here uh, and Rob Van Dam is on the cusp of winning the World Heavyweight Championship. It was at this point where Triple H would come off the ropes, miss Rob Van Dam, he would duck out of the way, and Triple H would take out Earl Hebner. And this was the turning point in the match, because as Rob Van Dam would go up for the five-star frog splash, hit it absolutely pinpoint perfect, Earl Hebner would not be able to make the pin. He tries again. Still can't make the pin. Earl Hebner is out. And this has got to be one of the greatest falls of Earl Hebner. It definitely needs to go on the three-disc DVD set. Because he gets knocked clean out of the uh, middle ropes and just goes crashing to the floor. No one can do a ref bump better than Earl Hebner. If you're a trainee referee, definitely watch Earl Hebner. Because he is brilliant. Anyway... Um, at that point, Rob Van Dam tries to get up, tries to wake up Earl Hebner, tries to get him into the ring to do the pin. Um, he gets back in the ring, tries to talk to him again, doesn't get up. At this point, Triple H would hit the low blow uh, with Rob Van Dam seemingly out uh, and outnumbered uh, with Triple H being back upon his feet and with Sledgy in hand, it's now a two-on-one affair. Just as Triple H was about to use the sledgehammer, Rob Van Dam would come back with another spinning heel kick. It is at this point that Ric Flair would run out from the back, seemingly pick up the sledgehammer to go at Triple H with it, as he talked down to him earlier on in the show. And, um, yeah, turn his back on the WWE Universe, on Rob Van Dam by smacking him clean in the gut with the sledgehammer, giving Triple H a good chance then to get up, hit the uh, hit the pedigree, and I almost called it an unpretty here, but it's his pedigree, and uh, Ric Flair would then get out the ring, roll Earl Hebner in, one, two, three, your winner is Triple H. Now, this match was really good. Yes, it did have interference, and usually my spot here would be to say, right, it, it gets less points because of the interference. But this led to something bigger and better. And as we go through the rest of the year, you will find out what that is. It was pretty much perfect. It was a per it was damn near perfect match. I'm going to give it four and a half cheap shots out of five for that reason. It started off slow. It had rest holds by Rob Van Dam to show Triple H that he can be technical as well. Um, again, getting into the mind of Triple H works really well. Uh, and 
you know, Triple H reaching the point where he thought he had to go up to the top rope as well, um, which didn't pay off. Um, right down to the point where referee, where the referee got knocked out of the ring and Ric Flair would run down to the ring and cause what would lead to the finish. Um, really good. Really good. Great entertainment. Really good match. And we move on. Next match is for the Women's Championship. Yes, there is still one of those in 2002. And regardless of all the other stuff that seems to overshadow it, this match is actually pretty darn good. It is Trish Stratus, the two-time champion going into this match, versus Molly Holly, uh, who is multiple-time champion herself, and also a very, very good wrestler. Um, the commentators, uh, King and JR, more so JR, because the King's just talking about puppies all the time, actually do a really good job of getting this match over uh, to the audience on the other side of the telly. Also, the crowd in the arena are very much into this match, and it, it's not a, a subsequent of... Um, the other stuff that's going on around this match in this pay-per-view, i.e. the HLA stuff, um, which is really sad that that is overshadowing this match because although it was very short, it was also very good. And you can also tell at this point that the women are actually being given time to train, time to put on a decent match and time to tell a story because off the bat these two just rip into each other I mean this is a hard hitting match at one point Trish gets sent out of the ring she goes careening out of the ring um, all the time the commentators are saying you know how hard she's trained to get to that point um, get to the point where she can put on a match and, and do things safely and that she's worked, you know, like I say, that she's worked really hard to do so. And that part really sold this match to me because you can see how hard she has actually worked on everything. And she's now not just a good-looking woman, she's actually a good-looking woman that can kick ass. And this match actually does that. Like I say, at one point she gets sent out of the ring. Um, she can take a beating as well uh, because he... Molly Holly slams her face into the steps and sends her into the barricade, um, really taking the fight to her. Um, it's at this point that Molly Holly is fully on top of Trish Stratus at, at, for a lot of the match, and it would only change when Molly would go up to the top rope, uh, seemingly wanting to hit the Molly Go Round, which is the blockbuster. Uh, pretty much with the um, leg rather than the... I can't remember what... I can't think what it's called. There is an actual name for that move. Um, it's basically a blockbuster. It's a... a, a it's, for, uh, it's like a 180... Uh, it's got to be more than 180. It's like a, a full somersault with uh, a leg drop. Anyway, she doesn't hit it. Trish gets to the ropes and knocks Molly Holly off. Um, it would be at this point that Molly would get, uh, Trish would go for the satisfaction. Molly would catch her and uh, tie her up in the ropes with her legs, uh, pull on her arms, and it looked proper nasty. Um, get up to the four count, breaking the hold. She then goes running into her with a handspring um, into Trish. Uh, gets a near fall at that point. Molly again fully on top. She, uh, Trish just can't get a break in this match. Uh, and it wasn't then until Molly would try and go for the finish that Trish would reverse that finish into a face buster and pick up the victory. Uh, so you have a new champion, but not only a new champion, but a three time women's champion. In Trish Stratus and uh, like I say short match but it did what it needed to do I'm gonna give this three cheap shots out of five and I believe that is the best rated 
women's match that I've seen in 2002, um, if I am correct. Um, but it was very, very good, very much worth a watch. And we move on to the next match. Next match is seen as a grudge match between two of the greatest technical wrestlers to ever lace up their boots, Chris Benoit and Kurt Angle. Neither have a championship run, uh, you know, neither of them are in a championship picture at this point on either show. I think both of these guys are exclusive to SmackDown at this point, and SmackDown was absolute fire at this point. Brock Lesnar, Undertaker, Kurt Angle, Chris Benoit, you name it, SmackDown had it, and it was really, really good. Add to that, uh, you've got Edge, uh, Rey Mysterio, and all the others as well. But, yeah, this match, as you would expect, starts out as a technical masterpiece. Breaks down reasonably quickly after that first first part of feeling out process and the thing is with these two you feel like they are actually having a fight they are fighting for every single hold there is nothing here that would suggest that they are not just reaching for every single limb trying to stretch trying to pull trying to crack every single limb and both of them are just absolutely brilliant at this and they had some kind of brilliant chemistry that has never really been replicated in in my opinion of in technical style of wrestling uh, of course both have a lot of aggression in them and it wasn't long before this broke down uh, with Chris Benoit starting to work on the shoulder of Kurt Angle of course making sense because that uh, would lead to his cross-face finisher. Um, both wanting to get, obviously, the, the, the tap-out victory here because this is a grudge match based on who is the better technical wrestler. Um, they would have a series of matches that were just absolutely brilliant. Um, and, uh, yeah, it would be the trade-off of ankle lock versus cross face uh, that would lead to the finish in this one. They go back and forth for at least three, four minutes. Uh, at one point, Benoit had the cross face and Kurt Angle had the ankle lock and they were just in a ball in the middle of the floor and neither of them would let go. Uh, Angle got the better of that one. Uh, Chris Benoit would then turn that over and get the cross face. Angle would come out of it and get the ankle lock. Almost getting the tap out victory there, but Chris Benoit would reach for the ropes and that would break up that. But it would be the finish that would make the... Uh, make Yeah, make it uh, a little less technical and more mind games because Benoit reversed the ankle lock into a uh, pin and uh, got his foot on the ropes with the referee not seeing what was going off and getting the pinfall victory something that no one that was watching this match would ever think would happen uh, but also protecting both of them in terms of the technical prowess that they hold um and also desperation, you know, desperation looms. It is a case of putting your feet on the ropes and making sure the referee doesn't know. Because if the referee doesn't see it, it didn't happen. I'm going to give this one three and a half cheap shots out of five. Just because of, uh, you know, that, uh, that finish. And although it did, did really work, you know, um, but Kurt Angle was more of the heel here rather than Chris Benoit. But... This is my discussion with quite a few people. Heel versus heel can work as long as there's enough of a story behind it. And there was definitely a story here behind these two. Um, again, like I say, really good match. Uh, precursor to the main event coming up 
pretty much straight after this um, and it got people going it got people ready for that main event uh, something that I haven't mentioned uh, was the uh, backstage segment before this match it featured uh, Eric Bischoff in the back in his office celebrating with all the lesbians uh, with three minute warning uh, they go off to party. Eric Bischoff keeps two of them behind because we've got that seg section coming up very soon. Um, but before that, we've got uh, an interview with Brock Lesnar. Uh, basically says, the Undertaker's got no chance. We'll find out in the main event. And so here it is, the moment you've all been waiting for, the HLA segment. <laughs> Oh dear, right, okay, so Eric Bischoff comes out to the ring with his two lady friends who he says, no, don't need to wait for Stephanie McMahon, we're going to start now, and then he says, wait, 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 I'll change my mind, he gets a massive boo, of course, brings out Stephanie McMahon, he says, you know, we didn't say that it was going to be one-on-one, -on -one. it was going to have a menage a trois, so yeah, they remove some of their clothing and yes they look very very nice i'm not gonna lie on that one um but it's sad to say that even though you've got some really good women's wrestlers some powerful women in the wwe in 2002 that this overtakes it all um yeah so he, then he says wait 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 no 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 no, no. No, no, no. So if if shaming uh, people's sexuality wasn't good enough for you, he now body shames people's sexuality uh, with uh, uh, bringing out the fattest, ugliest, most physically repulsive lesbo that he could find who came knocking on his door, apparently, in the middle of the night. So this lady comes out uh comes down to the ring lock slips with stephanie mcmahon and then promptly gives eric bischoff big kick in the face and rips his face off it turns out to be rikishi who would then go in for the stink face of course um stephanie mcmahon making sure that the tights were pulled right up between the ass cheeks and uh giving Rikishi a big slap on the arse. I'm sure he really enjoyed that. And uh, the most long, the longest sustained stink face, I think that was uh, the call from JR uh, here, uh, where Rikishi stuffs his arse in Bischoff's face. Good return for everything, actually. Uh, good payoff, obviously, Bischoff monster heel uh, as much as he does all these things and uh, yeah um, sure a few people were disappointed that they weren't going to see any HLA um, but <laughs> I mean it's, it's wrestling there's places you can go for HLA um, I'm not going to mention those here of course anyway we move on we're now at the main event Undertaker versus Brock Lesnar for the WWE Championship, who is going to be unforgiven by the end of this one? Stick with me to find out. So into the main event, it is The Undertaker versus Brock Lesnar for the WWE Championship. And as you can imagine, this is nowhere near as technical as Benoit and Angle, these two just want to throw punches and hit the big moves. And that is exactly what they deliver. As with most uh, main events of this time, uh, the referee gives the two combatant, combatants the, uh, a lot of leeway here. Obviously, Paul Heyman is by ringside as well. He does get involved. He gets taken out. Um, 
There's chairs come into play. There's two ref bumps in this match because if Raw could not could just do one ref bump, SmackDown can do two. We can do it better, as they say on SmackDown. Anyway, yeah, this is just an all-out brawl. There's, there's very little in the way of technicality here. It's just two big guys beating the snot out of each other, and I love it. Um, there was one waist lock that Brock Lesnar refused to let go of, bringing all of his roots and training from the University of Minnesota and before that, uh, amateur, amateur, amateur wrestling. Um, Undertaker finally gets out of that and, and swings him, swings Brock Lesnar out of the ring. This is where the chair comes into play and the title gets planted in between the Undertaker's eyes as Brock Lesnar is bringing the referee away from the incident. Uh, back in the ring, the referee takes his first ref bump when Brock Lesnar tries to charge in on the Undertaker and the Undertaker moves out of the way. Referee gets squashed completely in the corner and uh, doesn't stay now for as long as El Hebner. I get the feeling that El Hebner was putting it on a little bit in that match. Um, eventually, there's there's a chair shot and uh, a pin. The referee coming around quick enough to do that. Uh, there is a second ref bump and the Undertaker returns the favour of the uh, chair getting wrapped around the head of Brock Lesnar uh, because the Undertaker actually the Brock Lesnar didn't get the uh, the the chair shot he got the title shot uh, Undertaker didn't get the chair shot rather the chair actually gets wrapped around Brock Lesnar's head in an unprotected chair shot which always makes me cringe um, and yeah <laughs> the chair looked worse for wear Got a second one. Brock Lesnar falls out of the ring. He is now bleeding as well as, well as the Undertaker. Uh, Brock Lesnar finally, eventually, manages to get the upper hand again, and uh, get him up, get Undertaker up into an F five, which is counted, and uh, yeah, really, Undertaker showing everything he's got here because that was quite some agility for six ten. Uh, 315 pound guy uh, more strikes thrown in the corner Matt Hardy gets involved he gets the last ride for his troubles and uh, yeah the match continues on to the point where these two just fighting in the corner the referee tries to get in between them uh, gets moved out of the way can't control them Undertaker turns Brock Lesnar into the corner he goes at Brock Lesnar. The referee again tries to go in between them. Brock Lesnar then grabs the referee, turns him into the corner and says, stay out of it. Um, and these two then just go straight to the floor, start throwing punches at each other again. And the match is unceremoniously called at that point. And the crowd is completely at the throat of the referee and the call to throw this one out uh, as a double disqualification. Um, the action wouldn't finish there. Uh, Undertaker, Brock Lesnar would again go after each other. Brock Lesnar would get thrown out of the ring. He wanted to come back in. Bro uh, Paul Heyman would stop him from doing that. And as he was leaving, the Undertaker would come for him. The two would go at it again, Undertaker getting the upper hand and you knew there was something going to happen here, something big. Undertaker throws Brock Lesnar through the sign at Unforgiven. What a moment that was. Uh, very short, very succinct, but absolutely brilliant. Um, that being said, with all of the, the cluster that this one was, as much as I enjoyed the throwing of hands um, not quite I feel as good as the World Heavyweight Championship match but 
told a story good enough for next month, which uh, would lead to a Hell in a Cell match. And I believe we're looking at No Mercy at that point um, in, in October. Um, so, yeah, we've got that to look forward to. I'm going to give this match four cheap shots out of five. And, uh, yeah, this one, as a pay-per-view, was absolutely fantastic. Both of the main events were really, really good. And, uh, yeah, deserves your three hours. Um, deserves three hours of your time to, to watch this one. I am absolutely correct. It is No Mercy on the 20th of October 2002. Um, yeah, so these two would go at it again in another match. Um, so, yeah, this one, again, like I said, really, really good. Um, definitely worth your time. Um, and that is it. That is it for Unforgiven 2002 on the 22nd of September 2002. Um, if you watch the show, if you was there, let us know. Get in contact with us. Let us know your thoughts. If you're watching back some old pay per views, because we'd love to hear from you. Absolutely love it. Um, in the meantime, click the subscribe button, like the videos, join us on all of our social media. That's Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Don't forget the movie channel. That's uh, Quick Shot Reviews and Cheap Shot Entertainment System. The gaming channel where I'm actually playing games from the same era um, going through season modes on various games on the PS2 uh, great console by the way PS2 um, how I long for the days when gaming was so much simpler <laughs> um, but that's it thank you very much for watching you are the Cheap Shot Nation I'm your host, Luke. This has been Unforgiven 2002, and this is another retro review. We'll see you in October for No Mercy. Goodbye. Hiya!